some of you may, ooh, some of you may own the long discourses of the Buddha. There was an earlier version of the same publication called Thus Have I Heard, uh, the, and with the long discourses of the Buddha as a subtitle. And, uh, but first, before I go into that text, which is a joy to read, and I discovered new things every time you read them, um, I wanted to just connect this to the force for good concept of the course. And um, when I called Dan Goldman and told him I was going to base a course on his wonderful book, uh, he said, uh, and talk about the Buddhist sources of the course for good, force for good. He sort of mentioned that, well, okay, you know, it's a great idea, thank you, blah, blah, blah. You know, but actually, of course, uh, His Holiness wants the different initiatives, you know, like compassion, meditation, et cetera, dealing with neuroscience and things like that. He wants them to be secular. So he's a little nervous, I think, when I said the Buddhist sources, you know, like I was going to make the force for good into a religious thing. <laughs> he was, I think. So I said, well, I didn't, couldn't explain on the phone, but I just said, well, I think this, this won't hurt to show this background. It sort of enriches it. But actually, I could make a stronger case. I just want to do it here. And I guess, hello there, some people are out there online, co cozily in bed, snuggled up on a cold night, watching on the thing. And the great thing is they can just turn me off at any time they want. That's you guys are, poor guys are captive. But... Uh, so that's nice to do that. And uh, we're doing that because His Holiness asked us to teach more. He said, it's nice having art on the walls and showing Tibetan culture that way. But you know, the main th essence of Tibetan culture is the teaching. And uh, so we're trying to do that. So the thing about Shakyamuni that we will look, see today, looking at this, uh, these discourses, as I translate the word sutra, I think scripture is the wrong word for it. Sutra, uh, discourse is the real word. And, um, the thing about them is that he's being secular then. In terms of the science of his day, he is secularizing it. He is a rebel against religion, completely. And you'll see it here. You know, the Brahmins and the Vedic religion and the whole thing, he's totally rebelling against it. And he's not founding a religion at all. He is changing people's psyche. He's giving them some tools with which to work on their understanding. And he has no intention of founding like a new Veda, so to speak, you know, where you believe something. So the way we would define religion today is belief system, right? And that's the sort of anthropological. And sometimes, like Clifford Geertz or some social scientist will say, and a system of ritual behaviors that go along with the belief system. So it's like, you know, when I was in college, I studied with Talcott Parsons, famous sociologist. And he had this two, a great set of concepts, which he called different ideas. There were two kinds, pattern maintaining and pattern transcending. And he wasn't particularly referring to religion, although you can apply that to religion too. And mostly, but social scientists and mostly the way religious studies scholars, like in my department, the way they define religion is mainly the pattern maintaining sort of thing. And you can even see in the word dharma, you know the Sanskrit word D-H-A-R-M-A, dharma, which has uh, Vasubandhu in the fourth century or early fifth century gives 11 meanings in Sanskrit for dharma. And there's a line in the 11, in the middle, or a little maybe up two thirds up, where it goes from pattern maintaining to pattern transcending in a Parsonian sort of way, if you understand, if you follow me. And therefore, you often find Buddhist translators wrongly translating dharma when they're talking about Buddha dharma, Buddha's dharma. They call it the law, the law of the good white lotus. They'll, they'll translate the word law. And, um, and dharma in, its, in, in Hindi today does mean law, actually. And that was one of the meanings in Buddha's time. Dharma was law. Dharma shastra in Sanskrit literature means the law treatise. But Buddha redefined it. Why, where, why, does the, why does it become pattern maintaining sort of thing? Because it comes from the verb dr, which means to hold. So it means holding your behavior and, and your mind in a certain pattern. So law, duty, religion, custom, it has that range of pattern maintaining meanings. Now Buddha changed the meaning and added to those meanings teaching, which he meant by it, which he meant critical, thinking to break away from conventions and to understand the nature of reality, path that you travel 
by practicing that teaching and the goal of the teaching, which is the reality of nirvana. So the highest meaning of dharma means reality or, dharma, or nirvana. And then he took the, the etymology of the verb to hold by saying that what his dharma does is hold you in freedom from suffering. So it's the opposite, in a way, from the old pattern maintaining thing. It's totally pattern transcending, if you follow me. And, um, and therefore, it's, it's, not, it's not a religion in the way religion is defined and people go secular. You know, the Buddha, you'll see in these sutras, or if you read them, you already know, and I will, be, I will point out points in these sutras, where he's completely criticizing the existing religion of the Vedic Brahmins of his time. And even the religion of the Shramanic yogis, the seeker yogis. Uh, hi, Ina, how are you? Nice to see you. He's criticizing that, uh, that as well, you know, in a certain way. And um, the rebirth business and all this karma and all of that, he's also changing karma. Karma also meant before Buddha's time, and he may not be uniquely uh, uh, credited with the change of meaning of karma, but karma meant, in the Vedic sense, um, it meant um, ritual action. A karma was an action you did in a ritual because the Vedic people believed the gods controlled your fate and they controlled the world. And so you had to appease them and get them to do nice things for you and shape the world in a good way through by, by commissioning some priest to do a ritual for you. And then that ritual affected your destiny. So karma got to mean a kind of action that changed your and shaped your existence. But the Buddha completely changed that and he said this ritual, the gods, they, don't, they, can't, they can't take care of themselves. He didn't deny their existence, he just said there's no one all-powerful god. And the, the gods are powerful, and, but often they cause trouble, they have fights with each other, they, they have marital disputes and things, <laughs> like the Olympian gods in, the Greece, in Greece. So they're not enlightened and they can't save you from suffering. And, um, and so rituals appeasing them could have a worldly purpose, but it's not going to save you from suffering. So the only way you're going to be saved from suffering is understanding the nature of reality. And if you do, then you will be free of suffering when you fully understand it. So, so in a way, what my, the thesis of this book and why I was so excited in the course for good, force for good uh, and making a course through it or connected to it, is that the, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, in my opinion, and that's my thesis in this course, is doing the same thing of trying to help beings come to a better understanding of themselves and their world and therefore better behavior in interacting with each other in the world according to the science of the day, according to the secular humanist reality of the times. And therefore, because people are, you know, have an automatic reaction when they hear about rebirth, they think that's a religious thing and, and nobody, you know, there's no rational proof, it's not a scientific finding, although that's wrong. I, I argue that that's wrong, as I will. But, but most people just have a knee-jerk thing, oh, okay, that's some sort of superstitious religious thing because the consensual materialist reality doesn't get into it. And um, so he, just, he brackets that. He brackets even nirvana, and he just wants, he talks compassion, and he talks mindfulness, and he talks this kind of thing, which is just what Shakyamuni does in a different setting, and actually possibly in a more evolved cultural setting, actually, rather than ours. Although we think of ourselves moderns as so wonderfully evolved. But actually, there is such a thing, you know, there's being civilized and there's being savage. So there's primitive civilizedness, pre-modern, that is to say, civilizedness, and pre-modern savagery. And then as we see more and more in our world today, or if we lived last century through the middle, we would see there's industrial civilizedness, maybe, or as Gandhi said to Churchill once, that at least would be a good idea. <laughs> and there is industrial savagery, for sure. And uh, so we may be a little bit, you know, not so advanced as we think, anyway. Okay, so, so that's my, so the force for good, I'm saying is a secular, humanistic, civilizing force. Shakyamuni, his holiness, if Shakyamuni were to incarnate in this time, he would be the Dalai Lama, basically. That's about the best he could do, I think. 
And then he was, uh, he was in a society that had become somewhat stagnant, although by no means was it diabolical and hell and feudal and slavery and all this crap that Chinese propaganda says. But the, they were kind of jolly and happy in their funkiness, the Tibetans. And they were free, you know, they were nomads going around in the most amazing, look at this place, look at that. They were like in the sky there, you know. And they didn't, you know, they didn't have flush toilets. Gee whiz, you know, they returned the crap right to the soil, you know, and it helped grow more grass for the yaks. And, um, and the yaks kept the, the prairies and the pastures beautifully green like that, at very high altitude because the yaks are browsers. They browse and they don't graze. That's, did you know that? Yaks do not graze like cows they bro or goats or sheep. They browse. And that's an agricultural term. And it means that they lick the blade of grass off the root and don't bite it so the, it doesn't disturb the root. They have a very sandpaper. If you ever have, meet a pet yak, do, do not accept slurps. <laughs> Slurping kisses is like sandpaper, very rough tongues. <laughs> okay, so with that preface, and now I, I want to, yeah, I want to announce next week, uh, Elizabeth Pijov, very kindly, who is also teaching a lot of great compassion courses here uh, this year and in the future. We were delighted to have her. She is going to carry the class on the compassion training uh, as a special thing in the course because. She is trained at a compassion program in, um, from Stanford, which was set up by Dalai Lama's translator and Jim Doty, a friend of ours, named, uh, you know, a surgeon there named Jim Doty. And so she is doing the Dalai Lama's course for good. She's like an agent of the Dalai Lama's course for good and has been teaching here, which is our good, and at Columbia, actually, to students. So I asked her to be part of that, you know. And uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly what sources, Buddhist sources, she will do, but I'm considering that week to be connected by, as being connected to compassion. The underlying thing will be some Jataka tales, the former lives of the Buddha, the first sort of Disney lassie stories in world history, which were the Jataka tales. And Buddha was, when he was a former life, he was lassie. You know, and he went and saved, saved people from the burning hut or whatever. And, did different things like that. And he was the bodhisattva monkey, and he was the uh, whatever, you know, different animals. They're more of a thing. So, so on the sides, of course, for good is always on the reading list. But on the reading list for that, uh, w which will be on, will be some Jataka tales. But I haven't put them there yet, but I will scan and put some Jataka tales there. I think I have some scans. And uh, particularly, I'm very fond of, uh, of, the ones, uh, of, of the ones where he gives himself to people and beings out of compassion and generosity. And um, as I said, really like animal stories that illustrate moral tales of selflessness and compassion and wisdom and things like that. Wonderful one, uh, just to tell one, sort of a little bit in the line of preparing for next week. Wonderful one where he's the king of the deer in Benares. And he's a magnificent, amazing, huge uh, deer with antlers and everything. And he makes a deal with the king of Benares that they should only take one deer a day and not just go out and massively hunt the herds of his deer. And then he has a thing with his own group that one person volunteers and gives their life you know, per day so that they don't come and shoot 30 or 40 for the day. You know? And then there's a pregnant doe in his herd who <coughs> says, I'll be happy to take my turn. It came to her turn. But she says, I should really wait and give birth and then when the fawn is okay, then I'll go and I'll, you know, somebody should switch turns with me. And nobody would switch turns with her. So she, she, he comes to know this, the king, and he says, okay, I'll switch turns with you. I set up this deal, I'll go. And he goes to the royal kitchen of the king of Benhares. And the cook is a little freaked because it's not the usual deer, you know, the usual venison dinner. It's like this magnificent big deer who talks. And he says, I'm here today. You know, this might, well, you're not supposed to be here. You're the king. So yeah, but I'm here. I'm taking the turn today, he says. So then the cook doesn't really like chop him up right away. He runs up to the king and he says, your majesty, there's like a, a deer here. It might be a little too extra special for today's lunch. Would you come and check it out? I don't know what to do. And so the king comes down and then they have a conversation. And then the king says, 
you deer are better than us humans. Here you're going to give your life for a humble citizen of your, of your herd and look at me. So then they proclaimed a thing where they went vegetarian in Benares in that, in that, uh, in that Jataka tale. So he didn't actually die in that case. Sometimes he does give his life in those Jataka tales as a different kind of animal. Then there's, the, oh yeah, let's take one. There's the Buddha who in his former life was a rabbit. And as a rabbit, and I'm sorry, I forget some of the detail of that. As a rabbit, he made a competition with some other animals about helping a starving traveler in the forest. And they, one of the animals sort of gave him, brought him some water, and one of the animals brought him some twigs to make a fire, and another one, some the stone that he could make a spark and a fire and all this. And then, but then nobody really came up with food that he could much eat. So then the rabbit came and jumped into the fire and fed him with rabbit burger, you know, like stewed rabbit or whatever it was, fried rabbit. So then the, tra the starving traveler turned out to be Indra, the king of the semi-mundane gods, the Olympian gods, an Indian version of the Olympian gods. And um, Indra said, this rabbit is so great, giving himself to others so unselfishly. And he drew the rabbit in the moon. So in Buddhist cultures, and there isn't, when I grew up, I thought there was a grumpy old man in the room holding up a lantern, and I wasn't sophisticated enough to realize that probably he was looking to see if anybody was being naughty, <laughs> but I'm sure that was, the, that was the implication for me as a child. But when a Buddhist looks at the moon because of that tale, they see a bodhisattva rabbit who's wanting to feed himself to a starving traveler, which may be bad for their vegetarianism, but, but it's kind of cute, you know that they're drawn by the gods. So anyway, that's enough on that. Uh, and these stories that Buddha tells of his previous lives are really marvelous, and so I will put some of them up for you to read, but I'm not sure Elizabeth will talk about them that week. But I don't want her to do, talk about anything she doesn't want to talk about, so I want her to, to share with you the compassion teaching, and, uh, which uh, in, in its totally secular but very effective and wonderful way developed in the Special Institute growing out of the Force for Good in Stanford. Okay, next week. And then the week after that is Sharon, uh, and uh, that's, uh, that one is uh, specially, she will talk about the sutra that time, mindfulness sutra she will talk about, okay? And also the practice. But today we're talking about the Buddha's life as his teaching. You know, like one of my life ambitions is to make a film or a play about the life of the Buddha, actually a film really, but then there's some movement toward a play. And. Uh, Previous movies made about the Buddha, with the exception of one Japanese one, are very, have been very unsuccessful because they only concern his youth and his enlightenment. And then, then he leaves town. Then, then they sort of, they, they, people suppose he teaches. And then uh, they, um, he attains power in Nirvana, which they wrongly think means he leaves the universe, which of course he doesn't. And Pari doesn't mean final, as they translate it. Pari means thorough. So he just becomes not visible in a coarse body, but present all throughout time and space, actually, like joining all the infinite other numbers of Buddha. So um, they leave out the teaching, but the most interesting part of Buddha's life is his tangling with his society once he is enlightened. You know, by your, their fruits ye shall know them, you know, by the acts ye shall know them. You know, what, the way he deals with people and things, that's really where we come to see the Buddha in action. That's really what's interesting. And that's what we're doing here. So the first sutra, how many of you were able to read any of these sutras as a, a, a prepared students? Oh, wow. Oh, that's great. Does anybody have a burning question growing from any of, especially the first two we're going to do first. We're going to do the first three, actually, which are the uh, Brahmajala, I'm going through a little bit, and then my favorite one, the um, uh, Fruits of the Homeless Life, what he calls, or the Samana Pala Sutta, and then maybe the one called Pride Humbled by him, the translator, but really the Ambata Sutta. I'm going to try to talk about these three today. So does anybody have a burning question before we start about any of them that they read, that you want to ask before I start launching? Anything? Like, I was really puzzled about this over that or the other. No? OK, so we'll, all right, if you don't, you don't. You can, you can break in, and we can have one. And we will have a question period anyway after a while. I always say that, but it's dangerous sometimes because I get carried away, so you can interrupt me if you like. So, thus have I heard, 
It's always how they begin, evam maya shruttam, which literally means, eva means thus, just so, or something like that. And maya means by me, and shruttam, it was heard. Ekas min samaye, on a specific occasion. That's very important. Because why? Because that phrase at the beginning of a sutta, or of a discourse, recording, a recorded discourse, which is what suttas are in Buddhism, uh, indicates that the person who is repeating it was there when it was taught. So somebody I know wanted to translate once upon a time like it was a fairy tale, but that's not correct. It shouldn't ever be the case. It's real, and even have I heard is a little too vague. It means like I could have heard it like as a rumor or something. You know, that's oh, I heard about that. No, it should be thus did I hear on a certain occasion. And the certain occasion, the once in this translation is in the next sentence. But that's not, the once is not the fact that Buddha's living somewhere, although they've run together. But the once is, I heard it on once. I heard it at one time, at a certain time. Ekas min samaye. The word for time is a special connection time. It means meeting time, something like that. Samaya means it's a little different from just kala. Ekakala, ekas min kale would be just a certain time. And samaya can mean time, but it means like a time of meeting, a certain occasion. Okay? So, evamaya shuttam ekas min samaye. Thus have I heard, or thus did I hear on a certain occasion. That's how it should begin. Because the idea is that these really happen, and that someone's really reporting them. And um, Ananda, this guy with the idiot savant who could remember everything, you could re talk for two hours and he could repeat exactly everything you said. People do have that ability. A lot of them in these ancient times did have that ability. They say, and I believe them. So the Lord, or Bhagavan, that means Bhagavan, people tend to translate Lord, because it's like used later for God in Hinduism. But Bhagavan literally means one who has a share or has a fortune. So it actually means the lucky one. <laughs> it's a little less weighty than Lord, you know. But, you know, it has a, later the Hindus use it for God, Bhagavan, you know, they go. But Bhaga means a share, a portion, luck, and some other meanings later we'll get into it later in the course. But it, it, it's so Bhagavan and Van is possessive, so one who has a good fortune, lucky person. So once the lucky lord was traveling along the main road between Rajagirha and Nalanda, that's where the great university eventually arose, with a large company of some 500 monks. And the wanderer Supiya was a wanderer, that's a good translation for, for um, Samana, or in Pali, or Shramana in Sanskrit, which means a seeker, and wrongly translated ascetic by sometimes. I think he does sometimes too. But wanderer is better, or a seeker may be better, best was also traveling on that road with his pupil, the youth Brahmadatta. And Supiya was finding fault in all sorts of ways with the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, whereas his pupil Brahmadatta was speaking in various ways in their praise. And so these two, teacher and pupil, directly opposing each other's arguments, followed close behind the, the, the lucky lord and his order of monks. And mendicants also, I, I'm sorry to be critical of translation, but I, I can't help it. Monk gives you the Christian context of some lonely guy sitting in a cell looking at a skull, which sometimes they are Buddhist, Buddhist mendicants, but the Buddhist word, especially at this time, is mendicant. So they live in a community, actually. They're groupies, and they wander, and the mendicant means they live on alms, which means they're devoted to their spiritual pursuit and their educational pursuit. They don't have a work for a living. And in any kind of productive way in society, they're excused from that in a wealthiest Eurasian society of the day. And the society has the intelligence already by then and the generosity to support people, homeless people, basically. And when they're ordained, or so we call ordained, or when they're initiated as a member of the, of the seeker community, Buddha's seeker community, um, they, um, they, it's called they move from home to homelessness. So they become professionally homeless and living on alms, meaning they make of the whole society their home, so to speak, and people do take care of them because they consider people seeking freedom, higher understanding and knowledge, to be able to be on scholarship for life. They do feel, the Indian people at this time, enough to support this institution. Unlike our industrial society where we have the slogan, no free lunch, these people are living on a free lunch. But luckily, no dinner, no breakfast. <laughs> For the, 
for the community's economy. Only lunch, but they eat a big lunch sometimes. They, they, they ask for a big lunch. So anyway, but interesting, this is the first of it. It's a very important sutra about the sort of Buddha's teaching. But it begins with some people squabbling about it and criticizing him. And then another one arguing about it, in other words. Kind of fun. Very realistic setting. Oh, I have a nice tea, I forgot. But I probably can use. And um, <clears throat> so then they stopped, you know, I'm not, I don't need to read that, you know. And um, it's just so many things. Now here he's translating, blessed Lord, that's a good one. That's like the Lord, you know. He didn't bother with the blessed at the beginning, but he puts blessed. Although I don't like that so much as lucky, but it's not bad. I mean, he had a great fortune and he was blessed. And that was 19th century thing they used for Bhagavan. And what it did was I think it made people in a more rigid, monotheistic social climate feel, well, this guy is some kind of atheist, but at least he's blessed. Hope Yahweh is the one doing it. Let's hope, right? So, the, but it's nice, blessed Lord. Blessed Lord, the Arahat, that means enlightened, and the fully enlightened Buddha knows, knows etc. Sees and clearly distinguishes the different inclinations of beings. For here is the wanderer, Supiya, finding fault in all sorts of ways with the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. I'm sure you all know that these are called the three jewels, Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. And the definition of a Buddhist later on emerges is one who takes refuge in those three jewels and uh, leaves religions, actually, and, and, takes re and resorts to the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. But what is also very important about it and why it fits, I believe, with the secularist agenda of Buddha, like of his holiness, is that of those three, the Buddha is just the teacher of the refuge. The Sangha is the community trying to live with it, live by it, and share it with you. And the Dhamma is what one really takes refuge in, which is not only the teaching about the nature of reality, which is like fundamentally a scientific teaching, eliciting wisdom on the part of the student, more importantly than faith, meaning knowledge, and the reality taught. So to take refuge in the Dhamma means to take refuge in reality to can the old slogan in many societies that ignorance is bliss and you don't want to know too much about what's going on or you'll be miserable, more miserable, and that reality will make you miserable. And Buddha's whole thing is based on his discovery, well, he thought it was a discovery, and subsequently Buddhists have thought so, that reality is all right. <laughs> in fact, it's great, it's marvelous. Freedom from suffering, at the, me at the least, reality. And suffering all comes from not knowing that reality and living in an unreality. You follow? It's really quite simple. I mean, not that, not that we know for sure it's true. We can always question. But it's, it's actually fairly simple. I'm probably going to knock it all down if I don't be careful. So, um, so OK, so, so that, that's the real one. So anyway, they're talking and they're disputing. Then the, the Lord, the Buddha, being aware of, uh, lucky Lord, once were saying, went to the round pavilion and took his seat. And then he said, well, what are they talking about? And um, they said, well, we're talking about them. And then he does a wonderful thing, just like Dalai Lama, actually, which I like very much. You know, when these, lately, when these people have been screaming in the street at the Dalai Lama, and lately at me, too, I'm so honored. Uh, he says, monks, if anyone should speak in disparagement of me, of the Dhamma, or of the Sangha, you should not be angry, resentful, or upset on that account. Like his holiness telling the Tibetans, don't get mad at those people screaming. Freedom of speech, he just says. Don't be mad. If you were to be angry or displeased at such disparagement, that would only be a hindrance to you. For if others disparage me, the Dhamma, or the Sangha, and you are angry or displeased, can you recognize whether what they say is right or not? Now, that's like the Dalai Lama and his neuroscientific friends and psychological friends who prove that when you lose your temper, your judgment diminishes, and you become unable to distinguish fact from thing, and you get a very narrow tunnel vision, and you, you charge ahead or whatever, you know? So Buddha's saying that right away. He says that you're not going to know whether they're, you're not going to be able to think clearly once you get angry because they disparage me, and so you won't know. Maybe they have a point, or maybe they don't, but you won't be able to decide. 
Isn't that marvelous? It's just so Dalai Lama. It's just incredible. I just loved it. I never even noticed it reading this many times as I have in classes. No, Lord, they said. Well, if others disparage me, the Dhamma or the Sangha, me, the Dhamma or the Sangha, then you must explain what is incorrect as being incorrect, saying that is incorrect, that is false, that is not our way, that is not found among us. So in other words, you have to keep cool, and if there's something they're saying wrongly, try to correct it. But then he says, but monks, if others should speak in praise of me and the Dhamma or the Sangha, you should not on that account be pleased or happy or elated. If you were to be pleased, happy, or elated at such praise, that would only be a hindrance to you. If you got all excited, oh, Buddha's so great. Then you again, if others praise me, the Dhamma or the Sangha, you should acknowledge the truth of what is true, saying that is correct, that is right, that is our way, that is found among us, but meaning you should understand it and make a good judgment about it. It is monks or mendicants for elementary inferior matters of moral practice that the worldling would praise the Tathagata. And I think I've told you on Tathagata, means one who has understood reality, actually. And the reality here is being called tatata, which means suchness or thusness, but especially better is suchness. Because such is a very interesting way of, of say, speaking about something, because it means not quite what it is, but such as it is. You know? it means, such means like it, like it. It's different from thatness. Another way of referring to reality is thatness. And thatness indicates that the absolute nirvana is in every bit of the relative. But the suchness indicates that every bit of the relative points beyond itself to the ultimate. So they have a slight different thing. And tatata means in gata, which is past passive participle verb to go, is the word used in Sanskrit for understanding. Not a static word like we do in English where we stand under, indicating the authoritarian nature of our society and the obedience to a doctrine or a dogma nature of what we think of as understanding. But you go into a different world when you understand something differently. You know, then you're suddenly in a bit different place. You've gone somewhere when you're, through your understanding. It's quite nice. So tata gata is short for tata gata, meaning gone to reality as suchness, which is ultimately means the non-duality of nirvana and the conventional world. Oh, thank you. That's nice. Warm, mm, good tea. So then he goes on with the ethics, which I'm going to skip because it's not the main point of this sutra, although this is important. And one of the things you've noticed in later sutras is a lot of abbreviating, which is very annoying. I wish they wouldn't do that. But they may have done it in the original, for that matter. But these early sutras, there are long paragraphs that are then often abbreviated later because dot, 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 look back in Sutra 1 or Sutra 2 in order to avoid, I think, cut writing on, on palm leaf the way they did in ancient time. But in modern printing, you know, they have paper, you know. No need to do electronic. Anyway, so he gives the tenfold path, or he gives seven out of ten of the tenfold path of, um, of uh, skillful and unskillful karma, or what I call evolutionary action. And, um, you know, he abandons killing, taking life. And these are the negative ones. These are the unskillful ones. Taking what is not given, which means stealing. And unchastity for a monastic, for a mendicant, or sexual misconduct for a layperson. So those are the three physical ones. Then there are four verbal ones, which he refers to. And this is an ancient pattern that Buddha teaches always. But I'm going to skip it. I'm not going to get to that just now. Because I want to go to the, the philosophical part. And um, there's a whole set of things then about ethics, though. It's wonderful to read them. I hope everyone enjoyed reading them. One of the things that you get from this kind of um, sutra and Buddha making these long lists is you get a feeling of what the society was like, all the different things that people do. They played 10, ten row or eight row chess. Chess in the air must be three dimensional chess. They were already playing chess in the air. Hopscotch, spillikins, I don't even know what that is, dicing, hitting sticks, you know, the games that the monks don't play, the mendicants don't play. But what this, these two paragraphs are on pages 69 through 71 are, are, are Buddha's very intelligent formation of his community. I don't know if order is the right word again, but community, 
where he is forbidding the mendicants to compete with the Brahmins for the things on which the Brahmins do make their livelihood. And this is why he was not burned at the stake, because he forbade them to do this. Later Buddhist monks in different cultures do these kind of things. They do divination, they do ceremonies, they do namings, they do social services, so to speak, for the societies, because there's not a powerful Brahminical priesthood that would kill them for doing that. Right? So if you threaten the, kid, the livelihood of that kind of a community, you're going to end up, you know, wrecked, as we've seen in the West, you know. So, so anyway, that's all. But I don't want to go into that in too much detail. But I do, I do love it. I love reading it, actually. Whereas some ascetics and Brahmins, feeding on the food of the faithful, make their living by such base arts, such wrong means of livelihood as palmistry, divining by signs, portents, dreams, body marks, mouse gnawings, fire ablations, ablations from a ladle, of husks, rice powder, rice grains, ghee or oil, from the mouth or of blood, reading the fingertips, house and garden lore, skill and charms, ghost lore, earth house lore, snake lore, poison lore, rat lore, bird lore, crow lore, foretelling a person's lifespan, charms against the arrows, knowledge of animal cries, the ascetic Gotama, the seeker Gotama, refrains from such base arts and wrong means of livelihood. <laughs> People are still doing those things today, of course. And in his time, the Brahmins did them. So he goes on with that, but now he comes to the famous thing about this net of Brahma Sutra, or discourse, which are the 62 false views, or you know, sort of convictions where people get stuck, basically. And what is really fascinating to me, and I only noticed this two, three years ago, after 20, 30 years of reading this thing, on and off, the first um, uh, uh, yeah, I think it's the first, uh, how, many, how many, let's see, 34, the 34, the first 34 of the wrong views have to do with looking to the past, right? And they're really quite interesting. For example, and, and what I noticed only a couple of years ago was that it's a case of the Buddha analyzing a complex that someone becomes a kind of fanatic, which then becomes what he considers a unrealistic worldview, you know, where the worldview is blocking their encountering reality because they have some dogged conviction. It doesn't have to be religious, it could be ideological. And uh, the, these are wrong view number one. There are some, he says, there, there are mendicants, some ascetics and Brahmins, this is page 73, anybody who has the book, who are speculators about the past, having fixed views about the past, and who put forward various speculative theories about the past in 18 different ways. On what basis, on what grounds do they do so? There are some ascetics and Brahmins who are eternalists, or I might call them absolutists, who proclaim the eternity of the self and the world in four ways. And what, on what grounds? Here, monks, now, now this is so amazing. A certain ascetic or Brahmin has by means of effort, exertion, application, earnestness, and right attention attained to such a state of mental concentration that he thereby recalls past existences, previous lives. Now here Buddha is referring to previous lives as something that he thinks are there. <laughs> One birth, two births, three, four, five, ten, 10, 100,000, lots of births. In other words, rather high attainment, several hundred thousand births. And quote, there my name was so-and-so, my clan was so-and-so, my caste was so-and-so, my food was such and such. I experienced such and such pleasant and painful conditions. I lived for so long, having passed away from there, I arose there. There my name was so-and-so, and having passed away from there, I arose here. Thus he remembers various past lives, their conditions and details. And he says, the self and the world are eternal, barren like a mountain peak, set firmly as a post. These beings rush around, circulate, pass away, and re-arise, but this remains eternally. Why so? I have, by means of effort, exertion, attained to such a state of mental concentration that I have thereby recalled various past existences. That is how I know the self and the world are eternal. And this is the first way in which some ascetics and Brahmins proclaim the eternity of the self and world. Now, of course, Buddha's great breakthrough, one of his other great breakthroughs was 
the relativity of the self, that is, and, the imperm and it's meaning its impermanence and its um, emptiness or, or all kinds of ways he designated it, but basically ending up with the relativity of it, meaning that the core delusion that makes us suffer in the world is what we, if you think reflectively about yourself, you think you are a certain entity, your identity kind of looks out through your eyes and experiences things. And then you remember 10 years ago, you also experienced something. And we have a point of subjectivity that we assume is the same in both cases. More, no, often we don't even think about it, but when you do think about it, you, you will find, I think, unless you are already enlightened to some degree, that you're thinking, I was the same then as now. At the deep point of subjectivity, you know your body is completely different. You know your experiences and knowledge is completely different. But there's like a point of awareness, like the deepest point of subjectivity, that's just the same. And this, of course, gives people big trouble like when they grow old, because like I'm the same 16-year-old, and now I, I can barely walk, and I, I don't know, I'm collapsing, and all this, you know? Because there's a, and that, of course, is a super delusion. So he's not saying that it's bad to remember your previous lives. What he's showing is someone who is carrying, projecting that sense of unchanging self backwards, and, by, and thinking that there was something that didn't change all through all those lives, because they can remember them. They're not realizing that although there's a continuity, and they somehow have linked up through that continuity, then therefore they were completely different in those previous lives, of course. 100,000 lives, totally different. But they're assuming, because they can remember it, that it was the same. Do you follow me? So this is the first wrong view, or first unrealistic view. Second one, and then this is much, just longer, you know, and then now it's also eternity. And third one, it's just longer. And fourth one, the fourth is, there are three of the ones that just get longer and longer, you know, more and more lives remembered, but not up to Buddha, who remembers infinite previous lives before he's, at the time he's enlightened, which is, as you know, you know. And the fourth one is a reason, does it by reason. He reasons basically from his, uh, his sense of unchanging subjectivity that it's always been like that. He doesn't have the meditative experience, in other words, but he can reproduce it through reasoning. So he talks about them, and then he gives this paragraph that he, talks, he gives after every one of the wrong views. He says, these are the four ways in which these ascetics and Brahmins are eternalists and proclaim the eternity of the self and the world on these four grounds. And whatever seekers and priests are eternalists and proclaim the eternity of the self and the ground, they do so on one or the other of these four grounds. There is no other way. This monks, the Tathagata understands, that is the one, me, or anyone who understands reality, these viewpoints thus grasped and adhered to will lead to such and such destinations in another world. This the Tathagata knows, so they'll keep being reborn like this, and more, but he has not attached to that knowledge. And being thus unattached, he has experienced for himself perfect peace, and having truly understood the arising and passing away of feelings, their attraction and peril, and the deliverance from them, the Tathagata is liberated without remainder. There are amongst other matters profound, hard to see, hard to understand, peaceful, excellent, beyond mere thought, subtle, to be experienced by the wise, which the Tathagata, having realized them by his own super knowledge, proclaims, and about which those who would truthfully praise the Tathagata would rightly speak. And what are these matters? He doesn't say, you know, because he's going back on more wrong views. But he kind of indicates there's some other dimensions than just this one that I'm being critical about. Then he talks about partly eternalists and non-eternalists. And these are very amazing. The, 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 one group of them, paragraph 2.2, is a person who reached a certain level of the Brahma world which is in the realm of pure form, as they would call this, or pure matter, as I would prefer, and was a god for a long time. And then, they, when the time comes sooner or later, he puts wrong view five on 2.3, he should put it up at 2.2. But when the time comes sooner or later, after a long period, when this world begins to expand, in this expanding world, an empty palace of Brahma appears. And then one being, from exhaustion or his lifespan or his merits, falls from that Abhasara world, this is a pure light world, and arises in the empty Brahma palace. And there he dwells, mind made, feeding on delight, self-luminous, moving through the air, glorious, and he stays like that for a very long time. So in other words, he, he, he's, he's at a certain higher divine realm, 
and he falls and he enters into the, the first person in a new, after a new big bang, after a new emergence of the differentiated cosmos, like a planetary cosmos. But he's in a high heaven above it, a pure energy body and being, this Brahma. And then, then in this being who has been alone for so long, there arises unrest, discernment, and worry. And he thinks, oh, if only some other beings would come here. And other beings from exhaustion of their lifespan or of their merits fall from the Abhasara world and arise in the Brahma palace as companions for this being. And there they dwell, mind made, and they stay like that for a long time. And then monks, that being who first arose there thinks, I am Brahma, the great Brahma, the conqueror, the unconquered, the all-seeing, the all-powerful, the Lord, the maker and creator, ruler, appointer, and orderer, father of all that have been and shall be. These beings were created by me. How so? Because I first had this thought, oh, if only some other beings would come here. That was my wish. And then these beings came into existence. But those beings who arose subsequently, they think, this friends is Brahma, great Brahma, the conqueror, blah, blah, the creator, in other words. Father of all that have been and shall be. How so? We have seen that he was here first and that we arose after him. And this being that arose first is longer alive, more beautiful, and more powerful than they are. And it may happen that some being falls from that realm and arises in this world as a human. Having arisen in this world, he goes forth from the household life into homelessness. He becomes a mendicant. Having gone forth by means of effort, exertion, application, earnestness, and right attention, attains to such a degree of mental concentration that he thereby recalls his last existence, but recalls none before that. He just remembers having been the creator. Isn't this it's fascinating to me? I, I know this is what I noticed three or four years ago, like the 40th time I read this. So he becomes a monotheistic fanatic because he has a subliminal, probably, or some memory, because he became a bit of a yogi, of having been a divine being who thought at that time that he'd created the rest of the beings and the world. So naturally, there's a creator. <laughs> but he's in the human world. Isn't that amazing? In other words, what is interesting is, therefore, Buddhist psychology is, would be like Brian Weiss. You know, the, you know Brian Weiss? Some of you may or may not know Brian Weiss who was a Yale psychologist, psychiatrist, graduate, MD, head of Miami Psychiatry Hospital, Miami Hospital Psychiatry, who couldn't help some young woman until she started remembering previous lives and then figured out the traumas she had experienced with people who were reborn as her relatives in this life who were giving her a hard time and she was having a hard time dealing with them. So it was like instead of just the unconscious and blaming everything on the poor parents of this life, she's still blaming Still blaming them, but in what they did in previous lives. <laughs> but it gives you a much bigger database to work on. <laughs> I think it's fascinating, actually. And it shows that, they, that it, for them, it's a reality thing. And it may be a the form of life issue might be a reality thing rather than just some superstitious belief. In fact, which I think can be very much argued. That one I just is fascinating. And there are other... Now, there are a lot of other versions. I don't want to take too long because I want to get to Samana Pala. But almost all the other ones of these other ways are beings who were deities of different levels and then fell to the human level and then project from what their memory of their previous life as a deity was that, that a kind of worldview or a speculative theory about the world and are very stuck on it and cannot almost be removed from that view, you know, because the, this imprint from their previous life is so strong. And, um, and it, which is really quite something, I think. It's just marvelous. And, and then here, on 216, when we get up to wrong view 10, what he calls finitists and infinitists, he begins, there's four kinds of them, I think, 9 through 13, I think, or no, 9 through 12, you're inclusive. Here a certain ascetic or Brahman has by means of effort attained to such a concentration that he perceives the world as finite. And, uh, and then, uh, yeah, well, that's still the desire realm. So he, though he's sure the world is finite. It's around by a circle because he's in the desire realm, what the, they later called in their cosmology. But the second one, wrong view 10, he gets to the first jhana, 
first concentration, the four, the four dhyana realms or four contemplation realms of infinite, you know, the four immeasurables as, as they're called in Buddhism and in Yoga Sutra too, actually. The Yoga Sutra adopts that from, I think, Buddha. And these are the immeasurable love, compassion, joy, and equanimity of the four of them. And he thinks it's infinite because he attained to a vast state like that. And then the next one, wrong view 11, he goes a little higher and he thinks it's both found it infinite and etc. So in other words, each time, these are people who become, they are like become intellectuals and they become great yogis and through their yogas, yogic experiences, by taking them to have revealed reality to them, they get stuck in a certain ideology, in other words. And then later, he comes to some very ones, the sort of indeterminists, and uh, doesn't know what's good or what's bad, and the eel wrigglers, the, the, which are another kind of indeterminist, and uh, the chance originist, and then and then he gets there, eighteen. So, for, oh yeah. So now then he starts coming up with a lot of modern worldviews. Uh, when he after verse after world world wrong worldview sixteen. That's okay. Sixteen out to the past. Now he goes, chance originist who proclaim the chance origin of the self. So these are people who are randomists. Sound familiar to you? Modern biology, the evolution of the human being is totally random. There's no teleology in biology. There's no explanation for the arisal of consciousness from matter through complexity. And the fact that it happened is a cosmic accident. That the, that the, 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 the what do they call those things? The, the, the constants, you know, the, the numbers are just such that it supports the emergence of the, the elaboration of the brain and therefore consciousness. But the whole thing is a random mutation. And then the, all the changes in it are random and accidental. There's no, there's no purpose to it, in other words. In the attempt to escape from theism, the biologists have come up with that. But the, this is already here in Buddha's time. The chance originationists. And he says, um, they proclaim the chance origin of the self in the world on two grounds. What are they? Well, there are certain gods called unconscious. And these are ones who have attained what, uh, what he later elaborates into what are called the realm beyond infinite space and infinite consciousness, the realm of absolute nothingness, of absolute unconsciousness. And that's what a yogi thinks that state is the ultimate reality, and then they become a god of that, a deva, or a god of the unconscious, called unconscious. As soon as a perception arises them, they fall from that realm. And it may happen that a being falls from that realm and arises in this world. And he recalls that last existence, but none before that. And therefore he thinks the self and the world have arisen by chance. How so? Before this, I did not exist. Because he remembers having been an unconscious deity for million years or something like that. So he thinks that I just came from nowhere, uh, from unconsciousness. Now from non-being, I've been brought to being. So that's the first one. And the second one does the same thing by reasoning, which is like our modern people. So those are guess, also wrong, he's saying. And then he says he understands something else, but he's not going to speak about it right now. So then, then he goes on now. Now he's talking about the people who f get focused on the future. And he they declare that the self after death, wrong views 19 through 34, are various versions of saying that after death, uh, this and that will happen to the self. It's healthy and conscious and material or immaterial, or both material and immaterial, neither material nor immaterial, sort of four alternatives. Finite, infinite, both neither. Of uniform perception, of varied perception, of limited perception, of unlimited perception, wholly happy, wholly miserable, both and neither. So. These are the conscious post-mortem survival, and there's no other way. And uh, so those are, in a way, they don't really have a basis. They're just imagining that, actually. And then he goes 35 to 42. They say that the self after death is healthy and unconscious. <laughs> so in other words, I won't know that I'm there, but I'll be healthy. <laughs> and material, immaterial, both neither, finite, infinite, both neither. There's only eight of those, 35 to 42. And, um, and then 43 to 50, healthy and neither conscious nor unconscious. And um, finally, both conscious and unconscious, and he gets to it. 
and he elaborates that. But, but what these are, these, these are beings who in previous lives as yogis achieved the four formless realms, which the Buddha mentions very much in his sort of cosmology. Infinite space, infinite consciousness, absolute nothingness, and, or an experience of absolute nothingness. And, because they're all mental, there's no physical. And um, beyond consciousness and unconsciousness. And those four realms are realms of extreme stability that yogis can achieve. And the Buddha warns seeker yogis in his day and all throughout the tradition that if you're not forewarned about those states, when you hit them, when you go beyond the heavenly realms of the Brahma world and you hit those states as more calm and more, you know, you're indulging your wish to escape from any kind of interactions thinking they'll only bring you pain, being a sensitive and highly cultivated and intelligent being, you will think you've reached the absolute because you will think it's infinite space, or then you will, your consciousness will seem to spread and you'll feel it's infinite consciousness. Then those will become too kind of boring or irritating, and then they won't be calm enough, so then nothingness looks great, like a darkness, a great nothing, great unconsciousness. And then you somehow subliminally are the absolute. The absolute can because by the absolute cannot be a space. Yeah, it won't be absolute. That point is taught right in the beginning of the Buddha Dharma, which is therefore means the teaching of non-duality is right there. Through this, through this, um, taught in this way. So, um, and then there are some who sound like some of our people nowadays. There are some ascetics and Brahmins. This is it. We're up to 58, the last four. There are some ascetics and Brahmins who are proclaimers of Nibbana here and now, and who proclaim Nibbana here and now for an existent being in five ways. On what grounds? Well, he says, insofar as the self, being furnished and endowed with the fivefold sense pleasures, indulges in them, and then that is when the self realizes the higher, highest Nirvana here and now. So just having fun is Nirvana. Another one says, yeah, there's such a self, but that's not where you get nirvana. Why? Because sense desires are impermanent, painful, and subject to change. And from their change and transformation, there arise sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and distress. So when you get in the first dhyana realm, the first contemplation realm, accompanied by thinking and pondering and the delight and happiness born of detachment, that's when the self realizes the highest nirvana here and now. This sounds like our people. Anybody who achieves the first dhyana, you know, the four immeasurables, infinite love, measure, immeasurable, if they are materialistically before and untrained and unsophisticated about the self and about the critical wisdom that Buddha taught from here, they will think they've reached nirvana because it's relative to being running around normally, that meditative state is really blissful. And yet there's, it's not the highest bliss, but it seems to be the highest possible bliss to those of us who haven't had such an experience. So then the second one is the next realm of, up which is uh, the realm of infinite compassion, of immeasurable compassion. And he, you know, so he's just describing, you know, one, you still have thinking, but then thinking and pondering, that state is considered gross. But when the self, by, subsides, by the subsiding of thinking and pondering, enters and abides in the second dhyana, or contemplative state, with inner tranquility and oneness of mind, free from thinking and pondering, is born of concentration, accompanied by delight and joy, that's when the self realizes the highest nibbana, so here and now. So again, that's confusing a bliss state of a fairly still not that high kind of meditation, but very high for someone who hasn't meditated, as nibbana. Because it must be, because I feel so cool. And then the third one is similar to that. The third jhana, where they get into pure joy, and the fourth jhana, where, they, where joy seems too... Too, too much like an agitation, and they're just pure equanimity. Everything is equal, purified by equanimity and mindfulness. That's where the self realizes the highest nibbana here and now. And that is how some proclaim the highest nibbana here and now for an existent being. And these are mistaken. So these ascetics and Brahmins who are speculators about the future have another these 44. And then there were 18 of the other ones, so that's a total of 62. And um, so then he goes through the whole thing and and that's pretty much the end of it. And he says, uh, I didn't do any of that, and I overcame all of those kind. I didn't take any of those. But what is especially strong about this set of views 
is a lot of these views, the first bunch of views come from people who actually have it, are somewhat attained and have a memory of a previous life that's not totally subliminal or as many previous lives, but from the way they remember it and the way that they are unanalytic about their state of their actual subjectivity, they, they use it to create a, a fixated sort of view, a conviction that holds their perception it locked up, kind of, and uncritical, and therefore unable to get to pure experience of what of real reality, which becomes only relative. You know, the only th the only kind of experience a relative being can have is relative reality. Actually, uh, uh, anyway, because having an experience is a relational activity, and so a lot of them are highly are the worldviews that people are stuck in when they're highly developed. He, 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 he precedes it by talking about how and the community, and so that's fine. He doesn't bother them. But then the ones who begin to really attain something, and especially through meditation attain something, the 44 of them, and, but then it can then misunderstand their attainment. It, they get trapped. And this is why, you know, there are three kinds of wisdom. I mentioned this before, but this is why the Dalai Lama, you know, Dalai Lama can be very frustrating giving a public lecture, as some of you may have noticed if you have ever been there. I know a lot of people who have been to his lectures, and afterwards you say, how, did, how is it? And they say, oh, it's wonderful, because they like his field. They love the field of the Dalai Lama. But if they manage to stay awake throughout the entire time, they then say, but I had a lot of problems with this in that time. I couldn't quite understand, and maybe it was the translation and all this. But actually, His Holiness is very naughty in that he doesn't shy away from complications and complexities. And he'll go on and on about how that chair is not the leg, and it's not the seat, it's not the back, and it's not the thing in the floor, and whatever. And it disappears under analysis. People are like, what would the chair disappear? Or what? they like, well, you know, he'll go on and on and around and around with that sort of thing. But one of the reasons he does that is he's wanting people to realize they have to learn. The only thing that saves you from suffering, according to the, the Buddhist pedagogical, I'm not saying religious, pedagogical insight is understanding the world. And, they're, they're, and therefore it's wisdom. Wisdom doesn't mean just being resigned to what's going on. It means knowing, and therefore the word for prajna, wisdom, may not be the right word. It, intelligence and superintelligence might be the right word for prajna, actually. Pra means super, nya means to know. To the super know is what, is that what wisdom is? Maybe. To really know something, deeply, fully know it. That's what prajna really means. It's been set as wisdom since Edward Konza and before him. But is it just wisdom? I'm not sure. You know, you know, when you have a deep experience of reality, uh, where in a way you merge with it in some way, then, and not only that, but you have you are forewarned critically not to misinterpret that merger, <laughs> something like that. So it's complicated. It's not just simplistically like you can just throw away all your ideas and somehow you become one with the flower. That is actually a great experience, that kind of thing. But by itself, then, then, because then you remember it, then you interpret it a certain way. And then that's all, so the, so the intelligence always there, actually. And um, so, so, th so there's wisdom, anyway, that's the word we used to use, wisdom, or intuition sometimes I like to use, critical intuition or primal intuition. So wisdom intuition or intuitive wisdom born of learning, intuitive wisdom born of critical reflection, debate and thinking and doubting and wondering about it yourself, thinking back and forth, and only then wisdom born of meditation can it be effective. So in the general, in the Buddhist tradition, like I went to my original for root Buddhist teacher, I would say 50, 53 years ago, and I said, you know, I want to attain enlightenment, I want to meditate. And he said, yeah, you can meditate later. Now you can learn something. And that is the tradition, actually, in, 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 uh, all throughout Buddhist history. 
In the West, they've noted that Americans, Westerners, Europeans, Americans, modernized people, have learned too many things. They've been through graduate school, a lot of them. They've learned a lot of stuff. But what they learned did not necessarily lead them to nirvana or to attaining some sort of whatever. Maybe it gave them a profession, gave them some this and that, made them like become world weary. And so they're sort of thinking this learning stuff on some level it's like, oh, it's just more headache, right? Yeah, I can do long division in my head, but that doesn't make me happier. That actually makes me unhappier when I divide my salary by my years of work and my <laughs> pension when it's robbed by a corporate raider. And uh, so, so they, therefore, they don't want to learn anything. Therefore, just sit and meditate, empty your mind. Then they get a buzz out of that. Because they have, for once, they're not thinking, and they get a temporary, but, that, and then, they, then, they, but then the danger is then they're sort of, they become stupefied in their learning process. They become unwilling to learn another thing. And the other cultural prejudice is there that since we're the most modern, most advanced, most sophisticated, most scientific and blah, blah, blah culture, what really is there to learn from any pre-modern thing or person? Nothing. We know everything. Well, we sort of don't quite know exactly. We build nuclear power plants on top of geological faults in front of tsunamis. And so we don't really know what the heck we're doing, but we're, we can do a lot of things that make big bangs and big, big explosions. So that there's a new kind of learning that we need is really, really important. OK, so that's that one. Now, second, I'm sorry, I went a little longer. I meant to on that. Main thing being, so fascinating, the whole thing about former and future life are really here. And misunderstandings of former and future life are really important. And, but the reality of former and future life are the cause of the misunderstandings, in a way. So, no one, so it's not logical to use these as a way of saying, oh, Buddha didn't really think that was a former and future life. No way. OK, now this, I love this sutra. The fruits of the homeless life. Now, this king, Ajata Sattu, Vedehi Putta is a regicide, a patricide, and a matricide. He has a heavy karmic burden. <laughs> now, the patricide and regicide is not so rare in the Indian city-state kingdoms of that time, because the young princes got tired of the, being bossed around by the dad, so they did their edible thing, and they would tend to get rid of their dads if they hung on too long. And therefore, there was a tradition which Buddha broke away from, that the father, the, when, the, when the crown prince has a son, so still young, because they married young, then that son becomes the crown prince, and the crown prince takes the throne, and the father retires. And that's to avoid, precisely, the crown prince becoming impatient and wasting the father, because they want him to be the king. But that was the tradition. And therefore, Buddha, when his son was born, the father said, OK, I'm off to Florida. You know, I'm, gonna go, I'm going to Miami. You, do, you take over. And Buddha said, oh, I'm sorry, Dad, but I'm going on retreat because I want to attain enlightenment. So that was very upsetting to the father. Anyway, due to a manipulation by Buddha's half-brother or cousin, half-brother, actually, that's right, same father, different mother, uh, this king, as a prince, was manipulated into killing his father and mother. And the father happened to be a king. And now he's the king of Jatasattva. But he's a very intelligent also person and so on. So he's kind of bored, and it's the 15th day fast day. That means it's full moon, and they're fasting. You know, and he's doing some pious things here. Uh, it's a full moon of the fourth month, fourth lunar month, that is. So he said, delightful friends, is this moonlight night. Charming is the moonlight, auspicious this moonlight. Can we not today visit some seeker or priest, ascetic or Brahmin, to visit whom would bring peace to our heart? Because his heart is definitely not in peace, because he has a very guilty conscience. So then these different ministers suggest these different teachers who are a set of six who are often in Buddhist texts, even in Jataka texts, the same set of six. Kind of a six-fold set of false, ideas, false teaching that are there, which I, I, you'll see. And, uh, but the king was not interested because he'd been to see those guys and he wouldn't like what they had to say to him. So then he asked his doctor, Jivaka, who who actually made him not kill his mother physically with a sword when he was angry at her. But then she was locked up and made to starve to death by him, so he still killed his mother. 
But anyway, the doctor tried to restrain his, his violence, but not successful. But anyway, he's still working for him. So the, the, the doctor says, go see Buddha. Come on, the lucky Lord is an arhat, fully enlightened Buddha, endowed with wisdom and conduct. Well, that means, you know, super intelligence and ethical conduct. The welfarer, I think that's terrible. It means the bliss Lord, Sugata, one who's gone to bliss. The knower of the world's incomparable, trainer of men to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened and blessed. May your majesty visit the blessed Lord. He may well bring priests. He may well bring peace to your majesty's heart. Oh, great, let's do that. Then Jiva will have the riding elephant. So then he goes with 500 elephants. He's quite a powerful, wealthy king. 501 elephants. And he comes. But then when he gets to the grove where Buddha and the 500 monks are staying, he freaks out because of his conscience. Because he gets in the Buddha's field and the monk's field, which is very powerful because these are people whose minds are super calm and super connected and super blissed out. They're all very blissed out. But when an ordinary person walks into that field, what they begin is they start to hear their own inner thoughts very intently. Like when you go to certain monasteries and things, you have that experience. And, and, and then when he hears his thoughts, this king, he, his hair stands on him because he's uh, standing on, a, on an evolutionary precipice, having killed his parents and uh, so on, you know. So he gets, he gets freaked out and thinks maybe are they... So when Ajata came near the mango grove, he felt fear and terror, and his hair stood on end. And feeling this fear and terror and rising of the hairs, the king said to Jivaka, Friend Jivaka, you are not deceiving me, you are not tricking me, you are not delivering me up to an enemy. How is it that from this great number of 1,250 monks, well, not only 1,250, not a sneeze, a cough, or a shout is to be heard. These are people that are really cool now. Have no fear, Your Majesty. I would not deceive you or trick you or deliver you to an enemy. Approach, sire, approach. There are the lights burning in the round pavilion. So then he went as far as he could on his elephant, and he got off and walked in there. And then he said, Jivaka, where is the Lord? And then he said, that, or the Buddha, you know, the lucky Lord. That's the lucky Lord Tsar. That's the lucky Lord sitting against the middle column with his order of, of mendicants in front of him. So then the king went up there, and then he asked him. Uh, and he kind of likes it. And then once he overcame fear, he feels like a calm in the presence of all the monks. And um, he was thinking that his son, Udaya Baddha, is so such a brat. <laughs> I wish he was calm as these monks think. Of course, his parent must be frightened of his son because he killed his father, right? Remember? Then the king, having bowed to the Lord, saluted the order of monks, sat down and said, I would, he actually, actually, he tried to kill the Buddha one time in conjunction with that Ajatasattva, but he must have forgotten that. So then he says, ask any questions, says Buddha. Please, your majesty, anything you like. And uh, so then he me mentions all these people of all these different professions who are all productive people, right? And all these people, whatever skills there are, they enjoy here and now the visible fruits of their skills. They themselves are delighted and pleased with this, as are their parents, children, and colleagues, and friends. They maintain and support ascetics and Brahmins, thus assuring for themselves a heavenly happy reward tending toward paradise. Can you, Lord, point to such a reward visible here and now as a fruit of the homeless life? that is becoming a member of your community, you know, a seeker. So then Buddha's too smart to answer him right away. So he says, well, have you already had some answers to this question? Yes, I have. And then he gets the, gets the king to, to recite the six answers he got from the six teachers. And I won't go in detail on them, but one of them is someone who just teaches the, the guy about how you shouldn't do anything because it's all, whatever, meaningless. So don't do anything, and then everything will be fine. And the king says he didn't like that. And the other one gives a teaching of fatalism. And he, he, that's a thing where he gave a famous, that guy's very famous. He would give a speech, and at the high moment of his speech, he would take a ball of twine of a certain length, and he would toss it like that, holding one end. It would unravel, and then it would fall to the ground when there was no more ball. Then he would say, that's how you're going to attain nirvana. It'll naturally happen. It's just fate. There's nothing you can do about it. So don't bother with doing anything. And uh, then there was a materialist who says that, you know, it's stupid to think about needing to attain liberation. You're, you're just a material entity, and you'll just be nothing when you die. That's the end of that. So King didn't like that either. Then there's another kind of nihilist 
and then an indeterminist, and uh, some other kind. So there's six of them. And they, they, they continue to figure in the Buddha's biography, and they're always making trouble. And then finally, they go jump in a lake, actually. <laughs> but uh, but uh, that's another story. So then, he's, he's finished with that. And now, so now, Lord, he gives us six stories and it tells his answer to them. Then he says, now, can you tell me? And then he says, I can, your medicine, I'll tell you, but let me ask you some questions. And this is so clever. I love it. It's Buddha so great. He says, suppose there was a man, a slave, a laborer, getting up who worked for you. He didn't say that, but he means that. Getting up before you and going to bed after you, willingly doing whatever has to be done, well-mannered, pleasant-spoken, working in your presence. And he might think, it is strange, wonderful, the destiny and fruits of meritorious deeds. This king, Ajatasattu Vide, he put out Magadha is a man, and I too am a man. The king is addicted to an indulgence in the five sense pleasures, just like a god, whereas I'm a slave, working in his presence, I, and blah, 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 working in his presence. I ought to do something meritorious. Suppose I were to shave off my hair and beard, don yellow robes, and go forth from the household life into homelessness. And before long, he does so. And he, having thus gone forth, might dwell, restrained in body, speech, and thought, and mind, it should be not just thought, satisfied with the minimum of food and clothing, content in solitude. And then if people were to announce to you, sire, you remember that slave who worked in your presence and who shaved off his hair and beard and went forth into homelessness? He's living restrained in body, speech, and mind, in solitude. Would you then say, that man must come back and be a slave and work for me as before? No, indeed, Lord, says the king. And this is a patricide king, a very rough one. They made a war around the time Buddha was dying and killed a lot of people. Not a very nice guy. For we should pay homage to him. We should rise and invite him and press him to receive from us robes, food, lodging, medicines for sickness and requisites and, requisites and make arrangements for his proper protection. Well, what do you think, sire? Is that one fruit of the homeless life? This guy used to wait on you hand and foot, and now you're going to go feed him when he comes, free lunch? Has he made some progress there? <laughs> I love it. I can see the king gnashing his teeth. That guy used to work for me day and night. Now I'm feeding him. That's the fruit of the homeless life, a social change for the better, right? So then let me ask you some more questions. Well, yeah, OK, he says, but can you show any other reward? Yeah, but let me ask you more. And then, you know, the farmer does that too. And then, no, you know, the farmer used to work and produce things and pay taxes to you, but now you're going to feed him when he's a monk. Well, yeah, I would feed him. I would pay homage to him. What do you think? So he does that with a bunch of different professions. Then he goes and says what, how, how he himself, the Buddha, is really great. Your Majesty, it happens that a Tathagata arises in the world. And here's where he actually it confesses to being a Buddha because he wants the king to take him a little seriously. Because the king is a little, he's got him going now. He's, he's lost a couple of citizens and had a couple of monks he has to feed. So it happens that if the territory arises in the world, a saint, a fully enlightened Buddha, endowed with blah, blah, he says. So he realized it, you know, the enlightenment, by his own super knowledge and proclaims the nature of this world with its gods, demons, uh, gods, devils, and brahmas, its princes and people. He teaches the dharma, which is lovely in the beginning, lovely in the middle, lovely in the end, and the spirit, the letter, and displays the fully perfected and purified homeless life. So then so he's heard by a householder or householder's son, and uh, this person gains faith in the Tathagata. Having gained this faith, he reflects, household life is close and dusty, homeless life is free as the air. It's not easy living household life to live the fully perfected, holy life, purified and polished like a conch shell is much better. Suppose I were to shave off my hair and beard, don yellow robes, and go forth from the household life into homelessness, and after some time he abandons his property. He goes and does that. And what Buddha means by that is this is someone who shifts their priorities. You know, in a secular sense, this would not necessarily mean that everyone has to quit their job and go and be a monk or a mendicant, and you can't in a society where you don't have respect for monks. Oh, mendic and you don't have mendicants, and they're not respected. There's no, there's no generosity in this society to support individuals in that way. Don't even give scholarships to students. And Bernie Sanders wants them to go free to some colleges, and Obama's fighting for at least community college to be free. But that's not the case. 
Anyway, after having gone forth, so now he starts to tell what happens to this person. And this is the most important. The next few pages are really, really important. I hope you read them really carefully. And also, there's not, there's not much abbreviation in them. And I don't have time, because I don't want to just talk and read all the time. But it ends up, you know, the different stages of a person's attainment. And it ends up with this quite beautiful thing, you know, where a person attains nirvana, really. So he says, um, this is a fruit of the homeless life, more excellent and perfect than the paragraph 90 than the former ones. And he, with mind concentrated, then he does abbreviate, but never mind. You know, he, he talks about how he works his mind. Applies and directs his mind to the knowledge of others' mind. No, I don't want that yet. Uh, mind's concentrated, I want the last one. He remembers all previous lives here on 93. You know, so he's going through different attainments. And then he knows the, how beings arise, and he remembers everybody else's previous lives. And their future prospects, he also remembers, sees how they go, are going to go with the divine eye. And then, uh, and now this is the final one. And he, with mind concentrated, purified and cleansed, unblemished, free from impurities, malleable, workable, established, and having gained imperturbability, applies and directs his mind to the knowledge of the destruction of corruptions or addictions or you know, conflicted emotions, all kind of words for that, and conflicted notions. He knows it as it really is, reality. This is suffering. He, he knows it as it really is. This is the origin of suffering. That is the false view of the self and the false understanding and the false projection of absoluteness into the self. He knows as it really is, this is the cessation of suffering. That's nirvana, niroda, cessation of suffering. And then he knows, as it really is, this is the path leading to the cessation of suffering, the Eightfold Path that I went through in the last class. And he knows, as it really is, these are the corruptions. This is the origin of the corruptions. This is the cessation of the corruptions. This is the path leading to the cessation of corruption. I don't know about corruption. I don't like the word so much. Klesha is the term. Klesha means something that twists you. I translate it as addiction, actually. Because and it doesn't just only mean heroin or something. It also means we're addicted to some kind of confused ideas. We're conflicted to some dogged, rigid thoughts. We're addicted to our delusion and ignorance. We're addicted to our greed, greedy ideas, our jealousies, our angers. And, we, you know, and addiction is the best word. Some people try, I used to translate it as affliction, and some people still do. But affliction means just the suffering, whereas these are the cause of the suffering. And so it's something that twists you into the suffering. But why addiction is such a good word for this is, in a new Buddhist meaning of the word, in a way, more expanded meaning, is that addictive things are addictive because they seem to be beneficial to you. Like people think when they're lusting for something, that's really great, I'm all alive with passion. When people hate somebody and they feel angry, they feel, I'm so powerful, I'm really angry. When people are even deluded and confused, they're, they're just, at least I don't have to worry about, I don't know what's going on, you know, but I'm happy with that. So most addictions, or, and then when they have a fanatic idea, then I'm living for that idea, and they don't pay attention to what's around them. So these are things that seem to be helping us and benefiting us and are twisting and destroying us because they wear off, then we want more of them, then, you know what I mean, and then they have less and less effect, we need more and more, and, then they, and they are destructive. So corruption is not such a good word for it, but addiction, I think, is the best word for klesha. Kilesa in, in Pali. And through his knowing and seeing his mind, his, his, through his knowing and his seeing of these things, his mind is delivered from the corruption of sense, from the addiction of sense desire, from the addiction of becoming, from the addiction to ignorance, and, the, and knowledge arises in him. This is deliverance. And he knows birth is finished, the holy life has been led, done is what had to be done, there is nothing further here. And the birth is finished means involuntary birth driven by addictive emotions and passions and ignorances. It doesn't necessarily mean that life is finished. Just as if sire, and this is beautiful, in the midst of the mountains there were a pond clear as a polished mirror where a man with good eyesight standing on the bank could see oyster shells, gravel banks, and shoals of fish on the move or stationary. And he might think, this pond is clear, there are oyster shells, etc., etc. Just so with mind concentrated he knows 
birth is finished, the holy life has been led, done is what had to be done, there is nothing further here. This sire is the fruit of the homeless life, visible here and now, which is more excellent and perfect than the previous fruits. And sire, there is no fruit of the homeless life visible here and now that is more excellent and perfect than this. And note that even nirvana is not some mindless state of spaced out. This is a clear intelligence about this is suffering, this is freedom from suffering. No more of this dragged by involuntary, you know, driven by un an unconscious uh, being, unconscious emotions and, and, and fixated ideas. And uh, I'm free, you know, it's, it's just freedom. But the experience of freedom is the analogy for it is looking at a pond like a polished mirror and seeing everything on the bank and the oyster shells and the gravel banks and the shoals of fish. So there's, there's still discrimination functioning. That's a real powerful hint of, again, non-dualism. And contradicting the naive idea that nirvana means some sort of obliteration somewhere. It is an obliteration of suffering and of the causes of suffering. Of course, they are obliterated but not of life, not of intelligence. That's really important, which I'll be harping on it again and again, so don't worry. So then Ajatashatu said, excellent, excellent. He really likes it, because it's a beautiful teaching, this is. And it's progressive. It goes through the different stages of understanding and learning and meditating and realizing. And so he has this nice thing. It's like a lamp set up, and it's really great. And I go for refuge to, so now he claims he's going to go to refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. May accept me at this day forth as a lay follower as long as life shall last. So he sort, sort of really gets into that this, is, this guy knows what he's talking about, the Buddha. Transgression overcame me, Lord, foolish, erring, and wicked as I was, and that I, for the sake of the throne, deprived my father, that good man and just king of his life. May the blessed Lord accept my confession of my evil deed that I may restrain myself in the future. Indeed, sire, said the Buddha, said, transgression overcame you when you deprived your father, that good man and just king of his life. But since you have acknowledged the transgression, transgression and confessed it as is right, we will accept it. For he who acknowledges his transgressions and such and confesses it for the betterment in the future will grow in the noble discipline. So it's a kind of a good start for Ajatashatru. It's kind of nice, you know. But then this is sad. At this, Ajatashatru said, Lord, permit me to depart now. I am busy and have much to do. Do now, your majesty, as you think. For then the Buddha makes no effort to restrain him. Because he's kind of so, he's like made a big step like confessing and saying, I take refuge in you. But he doesn't stop and say, well, what more can I do to make sure that I don't repeat such a thing? that I'm really clear of the karmic effect of it, how he runs away. So then King Ajat said, but he was happy and he made a certain step here. Rejoicing and delighting at these words rose from his seat as through the Lord. But it doesn't say, I accept your, your confession, but he doesn't say, I absolve you of the, of the, of the consequence of your deeds. He doesn't say that. It's not, there's, you know, say 10 Hail Marys and you'll be fine. He doesn't say that. He just says, I accept it. He doesn't really say, I accept you as a lay follower. He doesn't say that either. Because he's, he knows that the king is still ambivalent. And actually, he goes on to do very more negative things, this particular king. So then Buddha does say, as soon as the king had gone, the Lord said, the king is done for. His fate is sealed, monks, mendicants. But if the king had not deprived his father, that could have been just king of his life. Then as he sat here, the pure and spotless dharma eye would have arisen in him. That means some degree of deep knowledge of reality which would have ensured him uh, that, that uh, he, but he was too frightened to, to open his mind that deeply, you know, because still there's a sense of, of guilt. So, okay, those are the two suttas that are really most important, although I did also want to look at the third one, but I don't want to take the time. I want to give you a chance to, to have a question uh, period now about these two. And then, I, and then I will say something more maybe after that about the Ambata Sutta. There. Because the, one, the third one, the Ambata Sutta, is, or the pride humbled one, this shows that Buddha it is not a namby-pamby at all. And he really gives a hard time to this young Brahmin. And he really stands up to him in a certain way. And he, and he really... <laughs> He really freaks him out, actually. He's very, very forceful in a, in a philosophical way. And then, actually, his, the teacher of this guy, 
I, I, I was sad that I forgot that, that the, I guess the teacher, the, the teacher of this guy who goes to inspect Buddha to see if he's all right or something, uh, he's, uh, he's rude to Buddha and he behaves weirdly. And then the teacher scolds him for that. But then the teacher comes, the teacher told him to go and do it, and the teacher was acting superior to the Buddha. But then the teacher goes and gets the idea Buddha really is somebody and becomes, but it doesn't say that he brought Ambata with him. You know, the one who gets humbled, which is sad. Did they leave Ambata like in the doghouse somewhere? I was unhappy about that. Because the teacher put Ambata up to it. You know. Did you read, did any of you read that one, the Ambata one? Was that in the, that was not in the Xerox, the, the pride humbled one? Maybe that was not in the, in the Xerox, maybe I jumped ahead to some other one. Yeah, I do also want to talk about the Aganya Sutta, the Sutra of the beginning. That's a very fascinating one. I want to talk about that one. But, um, so in other words, when you see the Ambata Sutta, you see the Buddha kind of vigorously interacting with the Brahmins, who are the great danger to his community. He, which he knows. He's just like sociologically super intelligent at this point. Enlightenment is super intelligence. It's not just be here now, do whatever, you know. It's super intelligence. And therefore, he understands, he's a sociologist. And he understands that this new order to thrive and to end up being an educational function cannot fight the priests. It's like that Hal Hama understands that he cannot fight the scientists. So he dialogues with them, you know. He doesn't want to fight with them. He doesn't want to fight with other religions. And he tries very much to say, he always says he doesn't want to convert people to Buddhism. He likes Jew booze, Chris booze, Hindu booze, secular humanist booze, sect booze, I think I'll call them. Secular humanist booze, sect booze. He likes those sect booze. And he doesn't want to struggle with any of them. Uh, because uh, although, when, if, they, if any of them really get down into the Nalanda University, if we had a proper university on this planet, which we don't still, we don't anymore, although I thought I would try to make one in my life, but I failed. But if we had such a university, then there would be some debates. There would be some serious debates, and maybe, maybe the Indians will rebuild Nalanda University. We'll see. Okay, questions now. Questions. Question time. Control yourself, Bob. Questions. Yes. Oh, good. You always have good questions sitting on the floor. Maybe that's why you have good questions. The floor. <laughs> yes. Um, so, in regards to the, sutu, the two suttas that you just uh, went over with yes. us, um, so the Buddha talked about people who, practitioners who had seen their previous lives. Yes. And to my mind, I had always thought that this was something special to the Buddha. Something what? Special to the Buddha, being able to see previous lives. Oh, no, no, no. And so I just wanted to find right. out, yeah, I guess obviously it's not. And so that's something that happened then. And if it happened then, how come we're not seeing it happen now? You know, people who are able to see past lives. I've, I've not heard of it, you know. Well, heard, you know. well, we are brought up to be total extrovert kind of, you know, and we're not instructed. It's not part of our education to do mindfulness to learn. You know, now it's a big revolution in the Aetna Life Insurance Company. Everyone's doing mindfulness. But actually, we should be taught as children to do mindfulness and how to manage our emotions in a certain way. That should be part of a decent education, which it isn't in our case. And um, because we are just part of a system where we're just supposed to follow orders. Still, still too much, you know. And... Um, so, but it's not considered a big, a big uh, attainment. In fact, there are people today, not only Brian Weiss, but there's quite a few other people. You can find them at places like Omega and Kripalu and places like that, uh, there, which are too few of those in, the, in this country and in Europe and uh, Japan and so on. And then they can do what's uh, re regression. You can use it for, instead of a um, deep level of mental concentration, you can be concentrated through hypnosis mild form of hypnosis, and then you will definitely remember future lives, former lives. Quite easily, a few of them. You know, if you're, I mean, I'm a hard case because very, I was brainwashed like a male chauvinist, waspy, whatever, you know, my education. So I had a hard time even I went to regression, even though I th theoretically think it's absolutely rational and logical about being former lives, and there's a lot of evidence for it. But I finally did in my 60s, I remembered a few. My wife instantly regressed and remembered three or four good lifetimes. And uh, which were very convincing to her. And, uh, you know, someone can say, oh, well, you're just going in your unconscious, or they're trying, to do, they're trying out some theories now, somebody in England, that you're remembering the memories of your genes. 
to try to keep, the, keep Richard Dawkins in business. You know, they don't want to have that you personally uh, were there somewhere. You know, it's you're remembering your gene memory. And um, so um, to get out, to, to explain the vast evidence there is of people remembering previous lives. And uh, you just go, and what you do is you get a little bit of mindfulness, a little bit of ability to concentrate, and then you sit and you practice where you go back in this life, like you are 25 years old, and you, what were you doing this day, you know, January 13th, when you were 15 years old? You do not remember that. You don't doubt that it happened. But you could do a meditation where you go and try to remember, and you might remember some outstanding experiences, and you keep working back, you know. People do that with shrinks, you know. They start remembering free associating. Because the knowledge, the memories are there. And then you go, you, but you do that meditatively, more powerfully than you can with a shrink, much faster. And then you sort of get a run up and then you go back and you find that other life, you know. You'll sort of see something and some landscape or some article of clothing or house or a face. Pretty easy. And the regression people are very good at helping you do that. There's a whole bunch of them. So just go and try it. See? See how you do. And uh, it's very convincing when you do. And, um, and, uh, it, uh, uh, and, you know, people who are theoretically stuck still wouldn't deal with it. Although I had a big debate with a really heavily theoretically stuck person once, and I, and who happened to be of Irish background, and I said, if you were in a village where your grandparents lived, and you were at a bar and you know on a tourism thing and having a time, and then suddenly you said, with involuntarily after three Guinness stouts, to your friend, well, what happened to the house over so and so place? And they said, what do, you, what do you mean? That was destroyed in 1920. And then you suddenly remember that you know there was a house somewhere. Then you walk over there and the next morning and you see there was a house there. And who lived in it. And then you talk around and you find out you, you, the, the name you had was right. I said, all I asked that guy is, would you count that as evidence that you might have born there in a previous life? He refused to answer the question. He refused to say yes, but he also refused to say no. <laughs> he wouldn't consider the question. So he could hold the idea. Okay, another question. Any other, any other question? Or a question from online? It can be either one. Yes? I was very interested in the... Oh, the yeah, that, good. <laughs> I was very interested in the 62 false views. And my question on that... Because Mike, Mike. Is that of the oh, I'm sorry, sure. Um, yeah, the 62 false views. Yes. I'm very interested in that because we find a lot of the stuff that's sort of central to tantric, both Hinduism and tantric uh, Buddhism, a lot of the specific beliefs. And was the Buddha saying that, that these are false as in they are not accurate, or is it false in the sense that they exist, but they don't help you on the way to... You know, good question, very good mind. question. I don't agree, though, that these are the actual real things. Maybe some forms of Brahmanism might be are definitely there, but, but um, the real teachings of Tantra, I don't, like, for example, the people saying Nirvana here and now, that's Tantra, I don't think so. So I, I don't quite agree with that premise. But um, I, that's a really good question that you made. And I was thinking that myself, actually, today when I was rereading it. And I always do when I read those things. And you know, it's this thing about, um, but in each time he says, well, the Tathagata knows a bunch of stuff, you know, and what could that be? And he doesn't really elaborate what he knows, except that he's fine and peaceful, you know. So he's just saying these things are false. So let me answer this way. First of all, false conviction this, that we say, is actually not, the word false is often, is usually not put there. The false, it's just a conviction. It's a dishti. So it's the fact that these things are rigid views. That's one of the key points. They don't even put the word false because one of the, in fact, in this level in Buddhist teaching, one of the addictions is the addiction to dishti, that is to say to having a view. So this is somebody having a mind trap of a theory that they're sort of so living in that they are not watching their own experience in a certain way. They're subsuming everything into this, this preconceived idea that they have, like a prejudiced, rigid, dogmatic view. And so that's one thing. So some of the, some of the a seeming, a semblance of some of the ideas that you are saying are, are positive in other, some other traditions and even in other forms of Buddhist tradition seem to be being rejected here. And, um, and uh, I think that's true, but, but the reason that they are rejected here particularly is 
the person's distorted perception of the self. And he's not talking about that here. He's just talking about not to be hung up in dogmatic and rigid views. And it's like, for example, um, uh, you know, there's one place famously where in one sutra, Buddha refuses to answer a question about the self. He doesn't even say there's no self to somebody who's asking him, is there a self or not, type of thing. And then uh, Sariputra or somebody says, how come you didn't tell the guy there's no self? You're always going around saying there's no self. And he said, well, that guy's a nihilist type. If I go around saying no self, he's going to think he doesn't exist, that he's going to become completely reckless and trapped in that view that there's no consequence to anything that you do. So his psychosis of thinking he's something fixed and absolute is going to be exacerbated by what to someone else who is very stuck on their absolute soul kind of thing, who I then go say there's no such thing, no self, uh, is helped by that teaching. So in other words, even, even selflessness is not a dogma for Buddha, even in Pali level, if you follow me. So you can go at it, you know, and now nirvana here and now is what Nagarjuna says in a way. Now the tantra question, because you brought it up, I'll just jump ahead in the, we're sort of in Pali world, but I'll jump ahead and deal with it, which is that, you know, the non, it's not just tantra, but it's Mahayana, non-dual, this is nirvana. Nirvana is here and now. This is stated in a way in the sense that nirvana is non-dual from samsara. So the absolute is non-dual from the relative. But that's, that's sort of the goal. The one who is stuck in the relative doesn't know that experientially. And just going around saying that as a theory is not go, going to harm them, actually. That's why non-duality at the time of the, when Buddha was concerned to establish his community as a strong institution in India, he, he restricted the Mahayana, the whole Mahayana, as a kind of esoteric thing. Uh, and according, to, according to Mahayanas, of course, not to Westerners, but according to Mahayanas. Because non-dualism could be misused by people thinking that, well, whatever I do is nirvana, like I'll do whatever. Or if this is nirvana, it sucks and I'm not interested because I'm miserable here. Do you know what I mean? So there is no, obviously no way out or something, and then they become some kind of cynic. So, so non-duality requires a kind of basis in the idea that Although this is ultimately nirvana, so in a way, without knowing it, I am already at the goal. The process of removing the veils is a path. And, I, and just by saying I'm at the goal, it doesn't make me at the goal. And like Tantra, I was very much misunderstood like that. And I always like to tell a story about a dear friend of mine who remains a dear friend. But the first Kala Chakra initiation done in America in Wisconsin, she took that. And then subsequently, that, later that summer, she came to a course we were teaching about how to implement, to practice um, somewhere else. And in our summer school that we had at the Institute of Buddhist Studies in Amherst, Mass. And about 15 minutes into the first class on how to visualize the Kala Chakra Mandala, there was this frightened exclamation from the back of the classroom, like, what? We have to do all these complicated things? But we already got the initiation. <laughs> you know. So in other words, it's here and now, but if you don't really fully experience it, it, it doesn't help just to think that. But in a way, it does if you think it in the right way, which is, it is here so I can really work to get there, to get here or something like that. And I won't get, and even, I don't, the other misunderstanding is I'll get here as long as I don't think anything. So if I just shatter my thinking ability and, and stupefy my mind, I'll be here. No. Because suppressing the conscious intelligence doesn't suppress the wrong structures deep in the unconscious at all. It just temporarily quiets them and then they reassert themselves. You know? It's like the one who had, oh, I had a great meditation. That was all one. That was so great. And now I think I'd like a, a bigger portion than you, now that I'm back. You know, like a guru, guru disease. You know? OK, another question. Yes, oh, good, there's my, my Demica friend. What's that question? But we're on Pali now. Yeah, is, yeah. Is, that's my question. Is emptiness mentioned in, in any of the sutras, in uh, Pali sutras? Is emptiness mentioned here? In any of the sutras. Oh, yes, absolutely. Which, yeah, Where emptiness is mentioned is in one of the four elements of the truth of suffering. Uh, that's where the word shunya occurs. 
In other words, things are suffering because they're impermanent, because they're empty, because they're selflessness, and because I forgot something like because and impure. That's right. They're impermanent. They're impure, impermanent, empty, and selfless. But their empty has a sort of taste taken by people to mean sort of vain, you know, futile, you know, in that sense of empty. And selflessness itself, of course, is emptiness. And then there's different views from within the Mahayana deeper, more scientific philosophy or deeper philosophy, which is that uh, the mind-only people say that in the Pali suttas, uh, Pali discourses, the Buddha never teaches objective selflessness. He only teaches subjective selflessness, or subjectivity selflessness, let's say. So selflessness or selflessness of the person, pudgala nairatmya. And he doesn't teach dharma nairatmya. Uh, that is the selflessness of things, which is emptiness. You know, the deeper one, more on you know, the instinctual level of emptiness, and therefore the arhat is like backward or something. But the but the prasangikas, the madhyamakas in general, I think even the svatantrikas, both categories of madhyamaka, they say that is insulting to the arhats and insulting to the Buddha. In the in the Pali, he doesn't emphasize objective selflessness, you know, so that the sort of the superficial reader of it would mainly think about selflessness of personality. And actually, self, we do think having to do with the person. Even though we use the word self just as a reflexive thing, we say the wall itself, right? So self, in that sense, needs intrinsic nature or reality or identity. But we mainly use it about persons, self of a person. So um, they say he certainly taught the selflessness of things, of objects, by his things about, you know, you know, matter, the body is like a ball of foam, you know, it's like an illusion, like a plantain tree, like it's essenceless and coarseless and coreless and all this. But he taught it in a less explicit way. But the high arhats, they got it. They get it. Uh, and uh, they therefore sign up on bodhisattva thing automatically because they, they get non-duality eventually. And uh, they, they totally redeem that. And they say it is taught. And I go, I'm, I'm a little bit of a heretic, and I think some Tibetans totally and, uh, and utterly disagree with me. But I consider that Tantra is taught in Pali Suttas myself, totally. And uh, then they say, oh, how can you say that? It's not even an exoteric Mahayana. I once, one Tibetan geisha went really nuts on it. And I said, well, if you have a precious diamond inside a bag that you retrieve from a latrine covered with excrement and you pick it up in your hand, well, first you see some, some excrement and then you see a bag, and, and, but you don't know what's inside. But there might be this jewel inside there. You can't say it's not there. But where I say where it is, is like I always refer to the story of Yashas, you know, the Buddha's first lay disciple who was a yuppie. And he, there are different versions of the story, of course, in the Pali itself. And um, it, well, there's one version in the Pali where it, it, it's about Buddha himself in, in, a, in another life. But, but the best main story that people mostly accept in Buddhism is he's this yuppie. And he was out with his pals with some girls, some courtesans. And then they were drugged and rolled. So their American Express cards were taken and their clothes and jewels. And all they had left was their dhoti, you know, like a jockstrap. And they were like bleary and hungover and running through the woods and then looking to get their property back, you know, to find these girls who had like mugged them, rolled them. And uh, so like, did you see some girls? You know, they come into the Buddha's grove where he's sitting with the monks. And apparently he comes up to the Buddha and Buddha says, would you rather find your American Express card and some girls and some jewel uh, tiaras or would you, how would you prefer nirvana? And the guy looks at Buddha and goes, oh, nirvana, of course. <laughs> So what I consider that is he collided with the mandala of the Buddha's presence. He felt a higher bliss emanating from the heart of the Buddha and in the field of the Buddha than, the, than any bliss he could remember from any of his partying. Somehow it got through to him and lifted him out of a hangover, a sense of outrage, a sense of greed, and lifted him right out of that. And then he sat down and he heard the Four Noble Truths taught by Buddha. And then he got into contemplating that very intensely. Then his parents were worried about him, and they came looking for him. And Buddha put a shield of invisibility around him so he could finish his meditating while he chatted with the parents. And then, after the, then he realized nirvana, that kid, right then and there. 
And then he removed a, a type of our headship, let's call it, let's say, you know, some degree of it. And then he removed the screen, and then they said, oh, here's our son. And they said, fine. And the son said, wow, am I really fine? I'm super happy. And the parents somehow, maybe they had a second son or a girl, whatever, some nice daughter that they liked. They weren't that freaked out. Maybe he was too much of a party animal. They thought he was going to go straight. They were happy, too. And they took refuge in the Buddha, and they said they would support the community and so on. So, so the first, his first lay disciple was, was Yashas, which came in that, uh, in that way. And uh, so that, to me, is they, they enter the mandala of the Buddha's presence, you know. And then in many of these things, like even looking, the way he describes these th different states, you're looking at a crystal, smooth, and like someone in a fantastic, he describes the blissfulness of it in a really marvelous manner. So, and he radiates that, obviously. And so many people come at him in different ways, and then they just completely calm down around him, you know. So that was my argument to the... So in other words, Buddha did say that he, would, to the monks at some point in another one of these discourses, that uh, Pali discourses, that I withheld nothing from you guys. I've taught everything, he said. But, but on the other hand, in the 45 years I've been teaching you, you know, what I've taught is like this handful of leaves in my hand. And the teachings of the Dharma, of all the infinite numbers of Buddhas throughout the multiverse, are like the leaves in those, all the trees in the forest around us, he said. Another question. Yes. Microphone. You touched on this. Um, oh, sorry. You touched on the section from the Samanapala Sutra where he talks about um, wrong livelihood, and and he lists all these different um, types of things like um, reading omens and signs and. Oh yeah, that he doesn't allow for this. the monks. No, it's, he doesn't allow the monks to. And you said that it was actually um, a, a way of protecting the community I think from so. the Brahman. But in reality, what evolved in Tibetan Buddhism um, was a lot of this. Oh, of course. So, so how do they reconcile the, what, their reality with this sutra? Well, because, the, I see, that's a way that's a way of, I mean, you can understand it in different ways. You can say they were corrupt and decadent. And of course, they do say it's a corrupt and more decadent time. But uh, I see it in a, in a different way historically. Uh, for example, the Mahayana teaching, which I consider to be part of Buddha's teaching from the beginning, without question, personally. Um, but yet, it doesn't emerge as a well-publicized force in Indian society for about 400 years. And then there's a big argument among scholars who, of course, they don't consider Buddha Torah. They think people made it up later. Because they can't, they, because one thing about modern scholarship about Buddha is they think he's just another guy, you know, he's an Indian Socrates with an orange toga instead of a white one, like a Greek, you know. And he doesn't drink Ritzina, but otherwise he's just like another guy, like one of their Oxford dons. You know, they don't imagine some really higher intelligence. They refuse. So, so they wouldn't see someone who could have a see causality in a society for hundreds of years or thousands of years. Even they wouldn't see that. So, the, they, there's an argument: Did the Mahayana arise in the south of India due to different social circumstances? Did it arise in the north? Did it arise in the east in Bengal because of different circumstances? Because there are many countries in India, right? It's a subcontinent. And, but I, my theory is that it arose in all three places because those were the fringes of what's called the Sanskritization process of India, where Brahminism spread throughout India, even in Tamil Nadu and all these other places, along with Sanskrit. And so, in other words, the Mahayana, where, which in, interferes more aggressively with the lay people's way of being. You see, these things here in the Pali, he's just saying, I don't have my mendicants do these things. Right, so that they don't serve the society as priests. They purely are seeking enlightenment. That's, the, that's their role, and that's why they're tolerated. They become a kind of fourth. I, I, I do a diagram historically when I'm doing history. If you say that the marketplace of the Indian city-state, the dominant institution is the palace of the king. Then on this side is the next level are the Brahmins who have a temple. And they do all these services of naming and everything, and they live on the patronage of the king, which is actually why they are lower than the warrior class, the king class. 
Although the Brahmins themselves nowadays will say they were always the top, you know, they're constantly trying to say that kings are listening to them. But that's wishful thinking. That's like, that's like a tenured professor thinking that the trustees are going to listen to him <laughs> when he says, don't do research on kill monkeys, you know, in psych labs and things. So, so, um, so that second thing is the temple over here. Then there's the marketplace over here. And those are the three dominant classes. The warrior ruling class, the, the intellectual priest class, and the, and the merchant class. And then the, then the old fourth is open to the countryside. You know, and that's the peasants, the farmers, they bring the grain, they, they do the work, right? The working class. So Buddha planted there in the fourth side, though, but a little bit in the suburbs, seven stones throw away from the marketplace, in theory. He planted the monastery, you know, the vihara, which the Western word monastery is not right because it's not a place where you go to be alone. It's a place where these people who leave the home, the homeless people stay in a grove at first or something. Then later they have houses a little bit because it rains on them at a certain time of year, etc. And the people give them the grove and then they build little huts in it and then they become monasteries. But, uh, but uh, viharas is their quote, which just means an abode, you know. And then that fourth side of the thing, the reason they're close to the marketplace is that they go in every day to get lunch. And then in exchange for lunch, they give a talk. So they start changing the society, and the society tolerates this group of people who are not productive. The king doesn't dare to, like, defrock them. Even this warrior king, who is like a killer, you know, he doesn't dare do it. He says, I, I wouldn't, yeah, I'd feed them if they came to my palace. The Brahmins are the ones most threatened by them because they're starting a new definition of holiness. And they are kind of relativizing the power of the gods, ideologically. So they're the ones, you know, who would crucify them, in short, even Buddha, if they could have. And there you see his interaction in the Third Sutra with that Brahmin. The Brahmin's like, oh, who are you telling me this and that? Who are you? And, it's like, really, the young Brahmin is very hot-headed with him, and he gets deeply humbled. You, you, you should be that sutra. It's quite vigorous. But, but the key there was, don't at least bother their livelihood. Let them keep their livelihood. Don't do anything. Don't show any kind of clairvoyances or things to people. Just you're there, they're feeding you, and, they're, and you're changing the society slowly by creating a different vision of life and sharing it with them bit by bit. And don't go in and tell them, oh, you, should be, you shouldn't do animal sacrifice in your temple, for example, which they were doing in those days. They were not like vegetarian. And uh, don't tell these ones, don't be crooked in your business. And don't tell the king, don't make war on this and that person, although he generally tells them that's not a good idea. But don't, uh, don't go and interfere with the warriors. You're just seeking another level, right? And then that does influence, and then when that, the influence of that becomes really strong, then it's safe to bring out the big guns, which are the Mahayana Sutras, the Mahayana discourses. Like even in your layman, even your Brahmin, you should, you should uh, change your life, even your living in the household. You should start meditating in, at home and change the way you treat your wife and your daughter. And that's why he was reluctant to allow a female monastic homelessness. Because the, the women were the slaves of all these people, you know, as they are in most, most of the planets still today, unfortunately. You know? They do the cooking, the planting, the harvesting, the whole thing. The men go and plow once in a while, then they sit in the coffee shop in between, you know. And they bear the children, you know, they, they really do the work, right? So if, they, if women broadly could say to the Brahmins, merchants, and, and rulers, I don't like this job. I'm going to go be homeless and get a free lunch, which they do say, because he does allow it. But he just says, this is going to cause stress in the future. So you know, first he says, they can, do it all, they can start doing it at home because they're more advanced. But he doesn't ever say that, or at least not, we don't hear it. Until Tantra, he doesn't admit that. As far as being more compassionate and tuned to others and more connected, etc., they are more advanced than the male. Less violent, for sure. He knows that. But, but you know that if he would tell that to the male chauvinist kings and priests, and I don't think he would get, he wouldn't get far if he told it too forcefully. Any other question? Oh, we've almost run out of time. Well, we should at least do five minutes of meditating. Those of you at home who are running out of time, if you are, 
Let's meditate on this. Meditate on the personality. What I would like you to meditate on is the personality of the Buddha as revealed in these two, these suttas that you read. The Aganya Sutta, I couldn't talk about today. We've run out of time. But a very interesting cosmogonic sutra that the Buddha taught, the sutra of the beginning, it's called. Please read it carefully, and in a future class, we can discuss it. And uh, maybe on the 20, on February 3rd, we'll, we will do more on Pali tradition, definitely. So now meditate on meeting the Buddha through his presence in the discourses. That's what you want to meditate. And if you've met the Dalai Lama and had any kind of experience meeting him, you might get a taste of what it feels like, what it might have felt like to walk into the field of this different kind of person, which is a person who is not, you, you don't necessarily have a theory about it, but it's someone who's not only inside their own skin looking out at you, but who's sort of with you as much as in him, so him or herself. This doesn't mean somehow like glomming on you or saying say any particular thing necessarily, but subliminally you kind of feel listened to, received, accepted, reacted to in a different way than you normally do why people become very moved emotionally when they meet the Dalai Lama or when they met Buddha. And sort of it subliminally conveys the message when one meets someone like that, if one has that fortune, that there really is a different type of consciousness and that one can actually change one's own consciousness. It's a subliminal thing mostly. But try to meditate on that. through your imagination. There are people with a broader vision in this world than me. So therefore, I can broaden my vision if I learn more about them. This is the meditation, OK? Should have done it sooner, I'm sorry. focusing on this meditation, it then also becomes a possibility that other people that we don't necessarily think of as a teacher, they're not a Dalai Lama, they're our fellow classmate, they're our friend, they're someone we meet casually. They may be seeing things better than we are seeing them. So actually we might learn something from any of them. So we're open to learning something from others and not just thinking that it's just the way we see it. This is kind of the focus of this meditation. The wonderful thing about being a teacher, why it's such a, such a privileged and so, such a rewarding profession, is that 
you can learn from your students a lot. Half of what you, more than half of what you learn is from your students. Ding, out of time. Thank you. So next week, the compassion practice. To the Jatakas, former life story. <laughs> Hello, how are you? Laura. Ah.